Good to Go is really a science book masquerading as a sports book. And so all of these things that I've written about and the, the stories that I got the AAAS Cavalier Award for, it was p-values and statistics and methodology. This book actually covers a lot of that same territory, but it does it using the subject that people care very deeply about. You know, it's hard to get people excited about p-values, but there are a lot of people that care about sports drinks and foam rollers and things like this. And so it was really an opportunity to use a subject matter that people were inherently interested in to talk about the scientific process and how science works. At its most basic level, recovery is a return to readiness. So you do a workout or you do a hard bout of exercise, and it's all the things that your body needs to do to get ready to perform again. You know, addressing the fatigue, your muscles recovering, their strength, things like that. Athletes have always thought about recovery. It's been something that's been important, and people have sort of recognized that it's important. But with the advent of all of these products now that are claiming to help people make strides in recovery, it's really gained much more attention. And what's happened is now you have a bunch of marketing around this whole process. And so instead of just being a thing that you sort of wait and give your body time to recuperate, now it's this thing where people feel like they need to use products and do things in order to help themselves get back to that place where they're good to go. There's sports drinks, there's cryotherapy, ice packs, heat packs, saunas, uh, Tom Brady's magic pajamas, sort of anything under the sun. If you can come up with it and say that it does something for recovery, people are marketing it. Recovery is a really tricky thing to study because it's so multifaceted. There's not one single physiological process that we're looking at. There are so many different things that go into it. Um, it's not just physical, it's also psychological. And one thing that's really common is that athletes think of recovery in terms of their workouts and their bouts of exercise, but other kinds of things that we normally just, just call stress, psychological stress, emotional stress, these also tax the body in similar ways. And so if you're not addressing your psychological stress, your life stress, Stress, your work stress, you're probably not getting optimal recovery. The people who are doing research in this field are, are very upstanding, they work hard, they're well-meaning, but it's a really, really difficult problem to study, and this makes it really challenging to get good answers and to get answers that have you know, a reasonable amount of certainty to them. One of the first problems that you run into is figuring out how do we measure recovery? What does that mean? Because there are so many different aspects that go into it, it's how your muscles are feeling, it's how your circulatory system is, is operating, it's your psychological stress, fatigue, all of these things add up to recovery, but it's hard to pinpoint one single measure that you can look at that says, okay, you're recovered or you're not. Another challenge is that in many cases, people are studying elite athletes, and there simply aren't a lot of them. Most of these things seem to really exploit the placebo effect. And this doesn't mean that they never have any physiological benefits. So what ends up happening is you really need this expectation that it's going to work. And if you can get that expectation that it's going to work, you'll have a much enhanced product <laughs> and, and recovery method. And so I guess the first thing I would say is choose something that you believe will work and something that feels good to you. At its most basic level, recovery is just relaxation. Nothing trumps sleep when it comes to recovery. It is by far the most powerful recovery method ever known to science. So nothing else can come close. If you're not getting sleep right, you can forget about all these other things. It used to seem as though timing was really crucial. Um, there were some initial studies that made it seem as though timing was very, very important, that you needed to eat something and eat certain nutrients within a very short window of exercise. It was called the recovery window, and people used to really fixate on it. But it turns out, after they've done more studies, it's come across as that it's not so much the timing that's important, it's just the nutrients themselves. It was often called the recovery window, but I've had some experts that I talked to say it's actually much more like a barn door. You, know, you have lots and lots of time to get these nutrients back in. Um, the timing is really not nearly as crucial as they thought it was. 
So many of these recovery products promise to do something about inflammation and that's reducing it. But it turns out that inflammation is your friend if you're an athlete. This is what's responsible for the adaptation that you get from exercise. So the first time you lift a weight, um, you'll get much more sore than you do the fifth time. And that's because in between bouts, um, your body is re repairing that little damage that you do with the exercise. And so if you impair the immune system and you impair inflammation, you're actually reducing that repair system. I was actually really surprised that icing wasn't all it was cracked up to be. I had always thought, you know, icing really hurts, so it must be a really powerful thing. It must really be reducing soreness. But it turns out that although it does sort of reduce inflammation a little bit, that's not a good thing because it impairs your recovery process or it impairs your ability to respond to exercise. So you may make fewer gains that way, but also just that there's not really much good evidence that it reduces soreness or anything like that. And, you know, and yet athletes really believe that it works. I'm also an athlete, and so I brought both sort of the perspective of an athlete having tried a lot of these things and done things and knowing about recovery for myself, um, but also as a science writer, I bring a certain level of skepticism to the plate. And part of this is that I really do believe that science is the most powerful tool we have for understanding the world, but I also know that it's done by humans who are flawed beings and we have our biases and, and whatnot, um, but also I think there's a need to really understand that science is really hard. It's difficult to get definitive answers, and so we really need to be open to new evidence, but also to really interrogate the findings and ask, you know, what is it that we're certain about? What is it that we're less certain about? So often we're sort of told that science is this thing that provides answers, but it's really a process. It's not an answer. It's a process of uncertainty reduction, and I think that's a really productive way of thinking of it, so that we never ever get to like that absolute definitive last minute, you know, the, the last word, that we're always sort of open to new findings and that we're always thinking about the things that we're not sure of.